persuade you to turn out at this hour of the morning? Well, I was very keen to get up to Liverpool to the Garden Festival. Also, uh, I enjoy travelling by train, so this seemed to be the ideal combination. Um, in fact, I'm on holiday in Somerset and heard about it locally. I'm from Tamako. Did you used to travel on the station before it was closed? I used to work on the railway. I worked on the railway for over 45 years. What sort of work did you do? I was engine driver down in Tamakum local. How did you feel when the station reopened? Oh, I was very well pleased. Never shoot shot. <laughs> well, I think it's a good idea uh, to try and get the station off the ground. I'm not so sure whether it'll pay off in the end, but uh, um, yes, if they can get it going, and fair enough, it helps the local community. You know, it's bad to. How did you feel when the station reopened? Well, oh, excellent. Uh, overjoyed. But I got probably much through to the bomb. One of the finest things ever happened at Tumblebee. Would you go to the Garden Festival if it weren't for this trip? No. No, definitely no. <laughs> it's just the fact of being able to travel in comfort, is it? That's right, yes, yes. Travel by train. <laughs> What's the point about running special trains? Why do you do it? Um, well, it's twofold, really. Obviously, it brings us in a, um, a small amount of revenue. And the second part is, is it all goes down to promotion. It um, gets people in the way of travelling on trains, gets them used to where they can go by train, and uh, all this sort of thing. It's all to get people on the trains in the end. Templecombe Station is on the line from Waterloo to Exeter. It used to be a junction with the old Somerset and Dorset line from Bath to Bournemouth and closed with the S&D in 1966. Keith Bartlett, ex-Templecombe footpavement. Every few miles in that, and this was a big Marson yard, it's not only just for um, freight traffic and that, you had big pigeon trains in here. Apple traffic used to go up through the S&D overnight. 16, um, 16 trains short in the night used to travel up and down there. Engines back, pick up another load from Hamwardy Junction, come up from France and take them up to Bass. You had a permanent coal boy at Lower Yard. Used to go around knocking up the drivers and firemen so that they were up in time to start work at all hours of the night. You used to have a cycle and cycle round through eight rolling villages and knocking them up and everything. You had steam risers, um, boiler washers, cleaners, firemen, pass firemen, drivers, shed foremen, running foremen, they used to call them as well. There was any amount of jobs, you know, they did vary. And up here you had guards, shunters, booking clerks, and all the uh, track maintenance, civil engineering side. Um, I think there was used to be about five inspectors alone at this place. What did it do to the village when it closed down? Well, in the early days, you see, especially the local men, you had so many trying to keep their jobs, they moved away from the village completely to try and keep on PR and, of course, move away with dieselization. But unfortunately, I've lost a lot of friends through it. I couldn't afford to be distracted by anybody coming in the bath at that time. All the movements of the shunting uh, yard and that was done by a, a bell cold. The shunters were all different places in the yard and when they wanted to do a move, because it was all controlled by the signal box, they'd give you a certain bell signal and you knew exactly what move they wanted to make. Well, if anyone was in here talking to you and you missed 
but it didn't hear the call properly. I mean, you couldn't do anything. Well, at that time, the shunter would ring the bell, and he'd walk on up to the engine and trucks, and it had put perhaps a quarter of an hour or 20 minutes on the move, delay, you see. So you couldn't afford to have anyone at that time in here talking. Not like today, I mean, we're only too pleased to see somebody at time, but not at that time. Stan Flood, signalman at Temple Coombe. We didn't think to be so drastic as what it was when the Beachy plant did came in. It was uh, very disappointing uh, for people that had been on the railway for years. But I tell you, you've got to accept these things. And, uh, I don't think there was a big enough fight, not only from the outside councils and that at the time, but even from her own union to stop a lot of this closures. But it's, Coming back now, we've got this station open anyway. It's one reason why we would move out of Temple Coombe, isn't it? Because mm. of the station, mm. not having a car. I think it's made a more viable village, really. Quite honestly, I think when the railway moved out so many years ago, Temple Coombe died a death. And it's uh, quite possibly picking up now. What did you used to do before the station was over? Not a lot. I'd stay here. We couldn't go places because it won't work. No. If it weren't for our sort of mum and dad or something taking us, we couldn't go anywhere else. But now we've got a train, we can get sort of places. You can get out on your own? Yeah. yeah. What do you reckon to it? We're good. Very good. Nice. Oh, yes, yes, I go up to London quite uh, often. And um, my friend goes to uh, Sherbourne shopping, which is better than the bus, cheaper than the bus. It has helped us in a way, you know, as like the wife and myself, we like to pop up to London and it does help. And um, the only other thing we find about it is it's taking trade away from us. You know, in so much that people like to go into Exeter, Shaftesbury, and, you know, places they like to go shopping in big towns, you know. It, it was necessary. Yeah, it looks like a small village, but it serves a, a, a mm. big, wide um, catchment area. Matthew Boy likes the the train, so he was very pleased. He can see him out of his window. What takes you on the train today? I'm going for an interview in one of the schools. For, for a job, in fact? Yes, and I'm going into Sherbourne. So it's quite an important journey? Well, yes, it is really. What, what brings you to the station? I've come to meet a young French boy who's in London at the moment and um, I advised him to come to Temple Coombe. We live very near to Temple Coombe. It's lovely to find it's open again. Well, it means to me that I can get to work just in time, whereas before I was getting to work with an hour to waste, and I couldn't get home. I had to rely on lifts, and it was very inconvenient. Do you have private transport? Do you have a car? No, I haven't any transport. And I've been doing um, temporary work, looking after elderly people and children, and it means I can go as far as Plymouth quite easily, and Timmouth, you know, places like that that um, I wouldn't have been able to do before. What's made it possible for this particular community to achieve this? I should think it was the committee's determination, yes. really, and they really pushed and pushed, didn't yes. they? They offered all the help they could, and they really did everything they could. I'm getting they? a response. Yes. Oh, yes, mm -hmm. from the people. Ian Matthews, Chairman of Temple Coombe Station Working Committee. What made you actually want to reopen it again? Well, for various um, ways, I, I knew myself that there was a, a, a need for the station still. Uh, I'm on the local parish council, and they would, they've been fighting it for a number of years, but in a very sort of on-off, haphazard sort of way, nothing really organised about it. And you know, I thought, you know, British Rail's got a lot to offer, really, in terms of transport and comfort and this sort of thing. So this is how it, um, the background of it, how it came about. Just coordinating all the, the um, interested parties together to get a, a real proper campaign. What sort of reactions did you get in the, in the first place? Nil. <laughs> to put it in a nutshell, uh, virtually nothing from British Rail, the county, you know, it was just a, uh, oh, here we go again sort of attitude, and uh, we had to get over that, but we did. How did you prove that there might be some p potential for the station to be used? 
Well, the thing that um, uh, I suppose made the most impact was when we got permission to stop trains here for excursions to Payton. Um, this we we were well, we were surprised that we were allowed to do it, but we thought, well, in for a penny, in for a pound, we'll ask and take it from there. Well, they did agree to um, stop the trains here, and of course we had a terrific response, and it literally took off from that point onwards. How many people turned up here then? On what was the derelict platform, I suppose? For that first train, it was a little bit embarrassing, really, because British Rail had, had given us a, a minimum of 150 and a maximum of 200. But uh, obviously we wanted to give people the, the uh, best opportunity to buy tickets, so we set up three different places to purchase them. But this is where the problem started, because after about three days, we finally got together and totaled up. We'd sold 290 tickets. Uh, <laughs> we contacted British Rail, and they, they wouldn't let us have any more accommodation, so we wondered how we were going to get the numbers back down to 200. Well, as it turned out, um, <clears throat> we knocked off the ones that hadn't actually paid over their money. That left us with 270, which BR agreed to accommodate then, but told us strictly in no uncertain terms that don't do it again. So uh, we had 270 actually waiting on the platform on the 5th of September 82 for that first train. What was that um, occasion like? Oh, very nostalgic, uh, very, uh, very exciting you know, to think the train was going to stop here because it had a headboard on the front and I suppose that was what did it. But um, as the train pulled into the station and people saw the headboard and realised this is it, this is Tavalcoon's train, there was a, quite a spontaneous response in clapping and cheering and a few tears, I think, as well. <laughs> Where did it go from there? I mean, that wasn't the only train to stop here before it was opened. That's right. We, we uh, Because there was such a response, we, we managed to book another two trains uh, a fortnight after the first one and then a week after that, which again uh, were overbooked. Well, not overbooked, but uh, quite easily booked up to 200 each time. Uh, after that, um, obviously, it was September and, the, you know, won a lot of point of taking Pete to the seaside. So we concentrated on shopping trips to London and Exeter. What, what was this before it became the booking hall again? Well, this was the 100% signal box, instead of half and half as it is now. What work, what work had to be done to it? But, um, the screen was already in here to block off that end, and the British Rail men made it into uh, put the counter on and the speak through glass there, made into a normal booking office window. How often is, how normal is it to have a signalman selling tickets? Well, from what I believe, not very normal at all. What's it like dealing with the public for the first time? Very nice. It was a bit scary at first, you know. We, when trains are late, we expected to be towed off, but it's been wonderful here. It's been a pleasure to uh, meet the people. Very much. Oh. couldn't get 150 people to travel on the first train from Templecombe in 16 years, we're wasting our time. So we, we made that decision. If we couldn't get 150, well, the campaign would have stopped there and then. What sort of people were actually involved in the campaign, those intimately involved? A good cross-section. Um, all ages, all occupations, uh, a real good cross-section. We had representatives from local parish councils, district councils, county councils, um, the biggest employer in the area, which is Plessy Company, and they were down to promotion uh, work. We're, we've now the committee down to six. But my occupation is a, a carpenter. Um, Paul Brighton, he works for British Rail uh, in the area manager's office. John Gartel, he uh, uh, is, owns a contracting business with his father. Um, Marion Ellison, I think she does part-time secretarial work. Uh, Rita Smith, she uh, is um, a senior citizen. Luckily we didn't um, have to get aggressive, if you might use that word, like, you, like the sort of 
conjure up visions of action groups and this sort of thing. We never really had to get to that. It was just perseverance and, you know, if the softly, softly approach didn't work, we just got a bit more persistent. Paul Brighton is treasurer and publicity officer for the committee and also works for British Rail in Salisbury. How do you think um, BR regard your committee now? No. No. Oh, I, I think, you know, we work together. In the beginning we were just a bloody nuisance, you know, but... I think what they... See, they get approached by a lot of groups. You know, I've got to talk as a railwayman now, um, who think that they can come along and tell British Rail how to run their business. We've always taken what I call a professional, sensible approach, you know, to see their point of view, because we realise that obviously they're a commercial undertaking and just to stop trains for a few people at Templecombe, although it might be a big thing to us, is parochial to a large concern, especially if it's not going to make money. So we've always approached it sort of, you know, on the lines that this is good for them because it's making them money. <laughs> Bernard Whitehall, British Rail Divisional Manager. Um, I'm one of those people who are basically very frank and say what I think, and I told them the facts of life from day one, um, and uh, what would have to be, uh, what sort of costs would have to be uh, met, and although I said I would try and get these costs down to an absolute minimum, and I, I look at the cost situation for them, I made it very, very clear to them that at the end of the day it had to be a, a financial success and there was no way that we were going to pay out any money anyway for the reopening of Temple Coombe because it would, at best it was only going to be a reasonable proposition uh, for opening. Uh, we had people who were rightly saying, you know, is it worth spending so much time on a relatively small amount of possible revenue in the context of 500 million business? And that's a very fair question to ask in managerial terms. But uh, we're not, you know, we're not in the business just to ignore possible business. And although uh, it was relatively small, if we hadn't have made the response, I mean, the thing was there was no way it was going to go away. And therefore, it was far better to have a look at it in positive terms and get to the bottom of it once and for all. Stuart Carter, Personnel Manager, Plessy Marine. Well, as a company, we hadn't thought about it particularly up to that stage. It never occurred to us that uh, there was it even a possibility of it being reopened. Uh, but when we thought about it, in fact, it seemed a good idea in simple economic terms from the company's point of view. Up to that point in time, the nearest station was Sherbourne, which was a 20-minute drive, and therefore if we had visitors, which we tended to every day, who needed to be met from the train, that meant a driver and a car tied up all day, every day, for the five days of the working week. And therefore, if there was any chance that they could step off the train at Templecombe and be with us in literally two minutes flat, just walking, then that was going to be a good thing. Perhaps it could be said that the, the people, the leading lights behind the station working committee, aren't really the most high-powered of people in some ways. Um, what actually convinced you that those were the people to back? Well, maybe not high-powered in the sense in which you use those terms, but uh, they were enthusiastic, and that means a lot. And they were determined, uh, it was quite obvious from the first time I met them, that they were going to get the station reopened. Uh, we actually contributed to the working party committee. I sat on that as an employer representative, simply because it was recognised, I think, by the committee itself 
and indeed Plessy, that British Rail and the County Council would certainly want our view at some stage. And therefore, if they could see us being involved right from day one, then there was a goodly chance that they would be more impressed by that than if we came in at the last minute, uh, really as an also ran. Uh, for instance, we hosted a meeting uh, on the Plessy establishment here, which involved British Rail and the County Council and the local people, the committee, where we sat around the table and talked about, from the British Rail standpoint, what they were going to need to even think about reopening the station and from the, what the County Council would therefore have to input and what was going to be required of the local community itself. Templecombe Station was reopened on an experimental basis under the 1981 amendment to the 1962 Transport Act. This was crucial. It gave British Rail the confidence of knowing that they would not be bound by the normal drawn-out closure procedures if the station proved unsuccessful and had to be shut again. But there were other positive reasons for local confidence. I think the reason that people use the station is because the population's increased here. I mean, in the last 10 years, the average increase in the population in this area is about 35%. Plus the fact that this is the road system here isn't all that good. I mean, we're not served with brilliant motorways, although the A303 is not far away to drive to London, for instance. Um, you can't get to London, into the centre of London, in two hours by road, easily, as you can by rail. You know, I think that's a lot to do with it. Richard Edgeley, British Rail passenger manager, London and South East. On what grounds did you finally make the decision to reopen the station? It was essentially on the grounds that we felt that we could probably at least break even financially. It wasn't absolutely certain, and hence the value of the experiment, so that if we found that we lost money, we could always close down. Uh, coupled with the fact that the County Council were prepared to fund the actual cost of opening the station, and the working group themselves were prepared to put in the effort to top up the, the County Council's money. The committee have consistently used publicity although they agree with Richard Edgeley and Bernard Whitehall that British Rail were probably not influenced by it. Their targets were the general public, future users of the station, whose support had to be revived after earlier unsuccessful campaigns, and also the county council, who had to be convinced that they should spend ratepayers' money. Robert Chapman, Deputy County Surveyor, Somerset County Council. What were the big problems that you saw them at that stage? Determining, in fact, whether the demand existed for a reopening. And I suppose what really convinced us of that was uh, the level of local involvement. The fact that the working group uh, were able to generate so much enthusiasm amongst the rest of the community and the fact that they were able themselves to persuade British Rail to stop trains before the station was formally reopened and those were clearly being very heavily supported and it was that that really spurred uh, ourselves into uh, supporting the local community and acting as a catalyst as best we were able to get the thing moving. They were confronted I think um, it would have been April 82 with a figure of 30,000 um, which obviously straight away put them off which, from our point of view um, we wouldn't expect them to do anything different through various means we, we sort of got the figure down to a more realistic level of 9,200 pound which um, you know take it in against the 30,000 it seems very good value for money and this is well, the council felt that as well and they uh, put the money forward which got the project off the ground how did you manage to get BR to reduce their estimate? Uh, well, mainly through allowing us to do more work. Uh, I, I think this is really the interesting part of the exercise. It was BR were worried that the works required would be very much more extensive. And I think, to be fair, they were a little bit sceptical about 
to what extent the voluntary effort would materialise on the day when it came to, uh, to, to the work that was involved. Uh, in the end, they were, I think, pleasantly surprised. In actual fact, we were down to seven weeks to actually do the work, which is a bit close when you're dealing with uh, a volunteer labour force who you've got no idea who's going to turn up and when they're going to turn up, and it, uh, it was very difficult to, to get the timing right. Um, we were doing probably eight hours on a Saturday and a Sunday, and averaging about four hours an evening, and that was every evening. Personally, I enjoyed it very much, from the point of view that both the physical labour was exciting, because you've got a group of people down there who you saw every weekend, and indeed the local Borstal boys came along and helped on uh, several Saturdays. And there was a, a camaraderie amongst that group that uh, were prepared to tackle anything from digging a hole with a pneumatic drill through the side of the signal box to take the power cable, uh, or some of the young boys from the village filling in the gaps between the flagstones with new cement, and, and everybody pitched in. And in a way, that was the most exciting part of the project, seeing the thing come to fruition. The plant uh, for all the work we needed on the station was supplied by a local firm, uh, Gartel and Son. They became involved with uh, the work to get the station ready in an er early stage of the seven weeks. And as it turned out, uh, the, s the plant and the labor that they supplied was invaluable. I mean, reflecting back now, there was no way we could have done it without them, I don't think. John Gartell's firm contributed labor and plant which must have been worth at least two and a half thousand pounds. I heard Ian was having troubles um, with the excavation side of the project and uh, probably wouldn't get it completed by the time that we are set for them. So I, so I gave a message to the signal box, the chaplain of the signal box, to contact Ian, which he'd done. And I met him in there one evening and it was tamed from there. Why did you want to do it? Why, why was it worth making a contribution of that size? Railways. Well, it's not really. It's just seeing the train stop again there, and seeing it um, get used again instead of from gradually deteriorating into a, a bit of rubbish dump, really. What was it like working with a big organisation like BR, when it uh, came down to the practical work as opposed to the organising and the campaigning? Very difficult. Um, when they when they came on site, we we did we were able to communicate them with them quite well. But uh, in between times, we found it very difficult to communicate with um, British Rail as regards what was needed at the station. Like, they didn't seem to be aware, or they seemed to, the standard seemed to vary as each time we met them, uh, which did make it difficult on our part because uh, we weren't quite sure what we were doing. And each time we met them. Um, different standards were put forward, you see, as regards uh, fencing and this sort of thing, but um, we overcame it. Obviously, some of our engineers may have had a few uh, hesitations about it when it first uh, uh, was mooted, but once you met these people and got involved with their enthusiasm, and the fact that they were prepared to do anything we really wanted them to do in the way we wanted them to do it, um, I think any misgivings were soon uh, disappearing through the back door. <laughs> It's over 50,000 at the moment, and that is well above the target, the minimum target that British Rail gave us, a 30,000. 
we had to be above or approaching that target by October uh, 84. Uh, it clearly could get better as more and more people become aware of it uh, and the marketing within the locality takes off. On the other hand, there could obviously be some people who've been saving up a trip for years and have at last taken it and don't want to take it again. And so we'll obviously be very interested to see how, how the business goes. So far, it's certainly been encouraging and it's better than uh, our original forecast. It's within the range of error, I think, that we would have expected, but it, it's certainly better than our original forecast. I'm having to do quite a bit of commuting because uh, I'm on a course at the moment in London, so that takes me there two days a week. It seems every time I come there are more and more people using the station, and I'm, I'm quite certain that people would prefer to go by train than by car. I know a number of people still use a car, even to go to London, and it's nonsense. But what brings you to Temple Coombe Station today? A uh, car breaking down. It's more friendly. Mm. It's just like you imagine a country railway to be, really. You know, everybody has a chat with everybody else. It's lovely. I mean, the personal service you get, um, the attention. There's all the time in the world. There isn't the rush, the hustle, the bustle. It's very different. And it's very nice. I appreciate it. for annoyance though for the professionals involved when um, a bunch of amateurs are chivying, chivying you along to increase the number of trains or uh, trying to catch you out on you know, certain technical aspects of the thing. There was a certain moment in time when pressures became, uh, for, came to me from outside in a way that was you know, rather annoying because, you know, we have a lot of other things to do and we can't spend all our time looking after places like Temple Coom. And I was progressing Temple Coom in a particular way. But various things, and I had gone out of my way to meet various people uh, in order to try and make progress. And then we got a particular letter out of the blue that not only annoyed Richard, but myself <laughs> as well. And I mean, I, I was very close to saying, you know, but you know, one does, one goes away and says, okay, well, Fair enough, that was one letter that annoys you, but uh, don't let that destroy your, your logical approach to it. But we do get that. And people think that by keeping putting on pressure and bringing, you know, getting right into MPs and getting them to tell us that we're a load of so-and-so for not doing exactly what they want, they think that helps. It can be counterproductive. It, it can, some people might well respond, oh, well, if that's the way they feel, to hell with it. Why then was it necessary occasionally to point an MP at them? Well, you have to, don't you? You know, I mean, you have to... They weren't convinced at first, perhaps. So you've got the point, an MP at them. And we had to convince the MP, of course. You know, so. Stephen, my son, he goes to school. He goes away to school, so he has to travel quite a lot on the train. Um, and at the moment, we're not using Tumblecoon. You know, because of the sort of some trains stop and some don't. Rail has been so handy, and one wishes really that there were more all the trains, or anyway, more trains were stopping here, so that one could confidently go to London yes. and know that one would be able to get a convenient train back without making a bog. We've been trying to promote the station, but at the same time, that is uh, what the majority of our efforts have been put into, is improving the train service, because we feel that the only way we can keep improving the revenue is to improve the number of trains that people can catch. Did you have trouble convincing BR to increase the number of trains once they'd provided the minimum? Well, you can gauge that from the fact that uh, we found out that the painting train wasn't going to stop uh, after May, we found that in February this year, and it took from February to June an intervention from three MPs to actually convince them otherwise. How are you tonight? Very well, thank, thank you. you. Good. Very warm. Yeah.
But I think, in view of what that says, it might be as well to write to the MP and say, you know, what the, ask them to confirm that certain trains will be calling at Temple Coombe, and I list all the ones that we've asked them for in the in, in the past. In the past, I just read what I wrote. Let's have a look. Dear Mr. Boss Cowan, thank you for your letter of the 5th of December, including a letter from Mr. Kirby. We are absolutely disgusted to find that BR are again unable to keep their promise yet again, as in October 83 they promised an improved service from May 84. Then in April 84 they promised an improved service from May 85. Now we see that this consists of one extra train Mondays to Fridays, which we find totally unacceptable, and it would seem that they are taking us for a ride. Excuse the pun. <laughs> After all the hard work put in by the unpaid working committee and the hard working station staff, over the last year we have spent over £500 promoting British Rail's into capital services. We have just allocated £600 to tarmac part of British Rail's car park, and we have just submitted details of a proposed waiting shelter to the area manager at Salisbury for British Rail's passengers. And what have British Rail offered in return? One extra train five days a week. Why is there inertia when it comes to something like that, to getting trains stopped to the station that's now open. The outsider, it seems obvious, they should stop. Well, this line, as you probably know, has got a lot of single sections. And if you stop a train at a station, it's generally reckon you lose four or five minutes in the running time. And if that train is booked to pass another one on a double line further down the line, and it doesn't, you get delays. How important was it for you as a committee to know this sort of thing, to have this sort of fact at your fingertips? Well, very, because um, it had been silly to go to British Rail and say, oh, we want this to stop, we want that to stop, and knowing full well that it couldn't. On the other hand, in having a fairly good working knowledge of a line, we couldn't be fobbed off with a lot of nonsense. You know, if we said we can't possibly do that, because it would affect the timing of the train, we went actually went back to them, so yes you can, you know. Um, the main reason why we uh, continued promoting the station is because uh, what you've got to take into consideration is this Temple has been without trains for 16 years. So we had to educate the local population of where to go by train and this, how to use trains. Looking at the whole thing now in retrospect, uh, could it have been achieved just as well by officialdom, by the county council, or by yourselves, or, or did it really require the involvement of a local group of people? Oh, I think one has to say the local people had to play the principal part. I mean, Plessier on its own could not, and indeed would not, have said we must have it reopened and have gone to British Rail or the county council. The, the economic factors involved in that would have been far too great for us to consider as a, a single entity. It needed the enthusiasm of the local community to say, we want it open, uh, we want to support it, whether it's going to market in Salisbury, or whether it's an old age pensioners outing, or whatever the need was. I don't think it could have been achieved by officialdom at all, quite frankly. It relies for its success almost entirely on the general spirit that was generated in the community. Uh, we and British Rail, if it comes to that, I think, were carried along by that enthusiasm uh, in a reasonably modest sort of way, but we were able to oil the wheels and, and, and smooth the path, if I could put it that way. If you were being asked for advice by somebody else from within your own organisation faced with a similar thing, how would you suggest that they react to the sort of approach that you had from Temple Pool? You have to sit down and look at it in the clear light of day, and if you don't do that, then uh, I think you're going to be in trouble one way or the other because you're not going to be able to answer properly the people who made the proposition. You're going to be saying no without being able to back up that no with all the facts, or you're going to say yes uh, without knowing where you're going to land. You really have to do your homework right from day one and not react with the usual no. When I say usual no, I mean that's, the, that, that's what people think we usually say, and we don't in fact. Uh, it's surprising how often we do listen to what people have got to say especially when, you know, there is sense in it. I mean, a lot of people have got their...
What would you say to other people who might be contemplating trying to get their village stations reopened? Well, it's um, think long and hard about it, and it's not the sort of thing you can get into half-hearted. If you're not 100% into it and willing to put an all-out effort into it, it's, it's just not worth starting. You've got to be really determined and persevere. There's no other way of doing it. You've really got to keep on. Bye.